Welcome to the Clear to Close podcast with our hosts, local mortgage expert Ryan Bolton and Carson Jones, owner of Team Honey with Red Rock Real Estate. Ryan and Carson have the questions and answers, tips and tricks, do's and don'ts, and expert guests to help explain all the steps needed to buy or sell real estate. And now it's time for the Clear to Close podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Carson Jones, Ryan Bolton here. Today, we're going to be talking about abbreviations within the real estate industry, uh, both on the mortgage side as well as the loan side, because it seems like there's always just a ton of different abbreviations and something that a lot of people, maybe they'll know the real estate side of things, but not so much the lending side of things. And so we want to talk about a little bit of each of them and make sure everybody understands when they're when they're seeing these different abbreviations throughout their contract or throughout the process of buying or selling a home they have a little bit better idea of exactly what they mean. Absolutely. It's something we're the industry professionals. So all of us know with title companies or insurance, there's all these abbreviations that get thrown out that we know about, but then the client may not know. And there's a lot of times they'll say, what does that mean? And you just explain it. It's very easy once you right. know what it is. But then we have abbreviations of abbreviations in our industry. So we, there might be more military. Maybe there's more in the medical field, but I'm telling you what, there's a lot of abbreviations. So we found a few here that we want to just go through and just what does that mean and maybe dive a little deeper on a few of them. But we want, got a bunch of slides here, see how many we can get through and just see how many, what these abbreviations yeah. can mean. Yeah. So let's go to slide number one. So the first one is Rep C and then what is F and A? So, uh, well, Rep C, I should say, what is R E P C? Right. Yeah. We call it Rep C. So sometimes it's yep. the letters like F B I, and sometimes it's R I P. You know, you say yeah. it, and other times you just say the three letters or whatever. So, so what is a Rep C or what does R E P C mean? So, so R E P C, we as realtors and lenders call it the Rep C. This is the real estate purchase contract. So, real estate purchase contract. And essentially, this is the offer. This is the offer that a buyer is submitting to a seller for the purchase of property. Right. And uh, you'll have new construction repsies, you'll have uh, lot, land, water repsies. Uh, and then, of course, the standard one is just the residential repsy that, that we use for, uh, for your standard purchasing a home. Now, with that said, there are a lot of repsies that you could just go and find off of Google, which Ryan and I will always recommend to you never use those. Right. You should always be using the state ordered forms and the and the um, the forms that the state has actually created to make it fair on, on all sides because a lot of the forms that people will get from just Google or printing off uh, online somewhere are something that really is going to be favoring one side or the other, right, right? right? And so myself as an agent, if I ever get an offer like that, I say, hey, thank you so much for the offer. We have to have this on the state forms. We won't accept anything that's not on the state forms, really just for legality purposes and to just keep everybody safe. And it's just uniform. You know, we're all used to kind of seeing that same form, whether you're in Utah, Arizona, wherever you happen to be. And they've been vetted. They've been tried and true. They go through modifications as things change with HOAs or with VRBOs, or yeah. they always kind of are modifying and watching where the biggest holes are in the contract. And they just are always kind of tweaking it to match either the times or the type of property in it. Right. So within the real estate contract, we always call it F&A, cotton. <laughs> it's, always, well, it's always funny when you say F&A, but what is F&A inside the real, co real estate contract? <laughs> well, F&A is, uh, <laughs> is financing for the F and mm -hmm. appraisal mm. for the A. Oh, that's going to be a great short. Yep. That's going to be a great short somewhere out there, people. But yeah, it's that financing and appraisal deadline is one of the most important deadlines in the contract. Because once you pass that deadline, you have to close. That's right. past. You're basically, you're down to settlement. Your earnest money is at risk. You've kind of passed all your due diligence and appraisals and home inspections. So once you pass that deadline that's when things get a little bit more real and your earnest money is more at risk at that point. Right. And and, and you have other deadlines and you have the disclosure deadline for the seller mm -hmm. disclosures. You have the due diligence. So sometimes that might be an abbreviation of just DD as your due diligence deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, but FNA is is something that it can include a lot of different things. Usually FNA is when you're uh, every time I say F and A now, I start giggling. <laughs> F and A is when your earnest money is usually going to be going hard, right, right, which we're going right. to be talking more about earnest money today, um, as well as when your lender is supposed to have everything together and ready to close right. on the home. So if you're not ready to close, pretty much, you know, you didn't have your appraisal back by that deadline. That's something you need to work on. All right, and it might cause slide. you to say F and A. It if, might. Cotton. If you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to number three. Or sorry, two. Here we go. What is ERS? ERS, ERS. ERS, yeah. What it, is ERS? ERS. So ERS is the exclusive right to sell. 
but then they also don't include their uh, the, the next few words. So it's actually the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. Mm. Okay. So you'll see a lot of on uh, whether it's on Zillow or whether you're on the MLS looking at homes, you'll see it says listing type and it might say either EAL, which is exclusive agency uh, or ERS, which is exclusive right. So the e- exclusive right to sell is essentially the agreement between the seller and the broker. And the broker. Okay? So not with the buyer, it's basically contracting an agent to list the property on the on Correct. The okay. and, and a lot of people get this confused because uh, people think that you're just signing a contract with your agent, right? Hmm. Which, yes, you're signing a contract. The agent is a part of that contract, but truly you're signing a contract with the broker. With the actual so, broker. Yeah. so for myself with Red Rock Real Estate, Tammy Houchin, who is amazing, she's our principal broker. Technically, she's the one who is overseeing this contract. And then Tammy is hiring me as a 1099 contractor uh, to kind of facilitate this contract then facilitate the clients which uh, uh which is why i'm working for you but i'm also working for tammy under this contract as well so uh so the exclusive right to sell it's usually gonna be the first contract that you sign when you're ready to list your home right and does it also in that form tell you kind of the time frame to market it usually i see like okay six months one year i've seen some crazy ones that go forever it, it but can. generally um you see a date of how long they're kind of contracted to try, to try to sell the property correct so the exclusive right to sell it's going to tell you the date it could be anywhere from i mean two days up to 10 hmm. years whatever you want it to be um i usually like to try to keep mine between 90 days to six months depending on the property that more common that's, that's what i see too it's usually six months yeah and, and i try to even tell my clients say hey Give me 90 days, especially if there's a big competition to get the listing. Give me 90 days. If I can't do it in 90 days, then you deserve to be able to find somebody else to get this done. I, I really like this. Sometimes those agents will throw that form up, and a lot of people feel like, well, hey, I didn't read everything I trusted you with, and now you're throwing some contract. And that, that, yeah. that's the worst situation you want to do. If the client really wants to go, it's better off just, okay, so it, it didn't work out. Go, go our separate ways and trying to fight for something they signed and throw a contract. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes, well, you right. signed right here. You have to do this, you know. And that's what's great <laughs> about the ERS because this will actually – you can – determine all of these things about your listing and your listing agent and brokerage right there on this contract. The commissions, mm. you can right. determine, hey, okay, these are going to be a total of 6% commissions. 3% is going to go to the buyer's agent. 3% is going to go to the seller's agent. With that said, one of the things I like to do sometimes is actually say, okay, we're going to say 5% commissions on this. I'm going to give 25 to the buyer's agent, 25 to the listing agent. But then if I can bring a buyer on my own, I'm going to do an addendum to the ERS, which might say, okay, if I can find the buyer on my own, I'll cut the commissions down to three or three and a half percent total. So there's a lot of different things you could do, but this ERS is a powerful thing for sellers because this is your, uh, this is exactly what's showing you. Okay. This is going to be your closing costs on the, the settlement of this home. Perfect. All right. Let's hit another abbreviation. We got our producer over here, Freddie Mac. What is EMD? EMD. It sounds what is like EMD? a, isn't that like a ambulance type Maybe. thing? Maybe. Medic? Something. Emergency medical detachment? Dentist. <laughs> Dentist. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. EMD is your earnest money deposit. So a lot of times I'll get emails from my underwriter that'll say, okay, we need to verify the EMD. Yep. And so a lot of times I'll go back into the client and say, I'll lead the abbreviation. They'll probably put in parentheses what it means just so they can kind of see and get educated as we go along the process. And it kind of depends on the client. Sometimes I just get rid of every abbreviation just because don't, I don't expect them to know all that. But it's amazing that people don't realize that that needs to be verified. Any money coming into a transaction for the down payment, the earnest money deposit, we have to know where it came from, what bank account. We have to get that bank statement. And if, if we see a $2,000 or $5,000 earnest money check, we go to their bank statement and they didn't have that in their account. Right. We're like, okay, well, where'd that money come from? Oh, my dad gave it to me. Or yeah. I, bought, I borrowed off a credit card or I sold a car. Or, so it becomes a little bit more, it's probably one of the more frustrating things that clients don't realize that that still needs to be verified. Right. Now, a way we can get around it is just not count it as a credit, but then you have to bring a bigger down payment because you can't count that two grand. You just get it refunded from title. But it's amazing how kind of hard that can get because people get their earnest money all kinds of crazy ways. Family members, uncles, aunts, you know, and then we have to paper trail it every step of the way from the time you write the check, make sure it cleared, all the way to the end. And it, 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 one tip I can give you if you're looking to buy a house and you want to do your earnest money, just make sure you paper trail where the money came from. We're yep. going to ask for it or we can't count it. And, and a lot of people don't understand even what earnest money is right. in, in general, especially when a first time buyer, they say, what do you mean there's an earnest money deposit? And even at, let's say you're getting a Utah housing loan, right? Mm-hmm. Which a lot of times can be a 0% down. Then you can say, okay, well, we, now we're going to offer 1% earnest money, which might be a couple thousand dollars. They say, well, I don't have a couple right. thousand dollars right now to put down. I said, that's going to hurt your offer. So essentially what earnest money is, is your, it's almost like a good faith showing, showing your seller, Hey, this is the amount of money that we're willing to hold in escrow to show you that we're serious about the mm-hmm. place. And then if we were to back out after 
X deadline, right, um, then you're going to get that money back. And that could depend on the type of loan and and uh, depending on what deadline that might be. Uh, but for the most part, the earnest money is always going to be refundable if you back out prior to deadlines. Yeah, there's so, so much more protection for buyers when it comes to that. Yeah, there until is. Until you pass certain deadlines. But really, I've had clients both ways. They're like, oh, do I just lose that money? Yeah. And then other times, okay, is that, where does that credit go? You know, it just goes to the seller. So it is something where you're basically – got some skin in the game. Yeah. You've got someone say, hey, they're taking the house off the market for 30, 40, 50 days, whatever it is. If you then don't fulfill ob- your obligation on the contract, they should get some reimbursement for that. So, And it just legitimizes that it's a true contract. And so. this is one thing sellers need to understand. Sellers, a lot of the time, don't understand how difficult it may be for them to back out of a home. Right. It's much harder on the seller. It, yes. it is. <laughs> and, and one thing that the contract, the, the REPSI, which we've already talked about, says is that if the seller defaults, so let's say the seller says, hey, I don't want to sell you my house anymore. I'm sorry, I'm backing out. The seller will, of course, then refund the earnest money, plus they could be held to actually paying the same amount of earnest money mm. to those buyers as so well. So you're saying if it's a 5000 earnest money, they could end up paying 10000 to the buyer. And you know what? I, I've actually seen it where mm. it's been $50,000. Earn- say it's a, mm. a, a million-plus-dollar house. They could have fifty dollars to $100,000 of earnest money very quickly. And if the seller starts getting cold feet saying, you know what, I don't think I'm going to sell my house, you could, they could be owing fifty dollars to $100,000. So I know sellers, a lot of the time, they want to say, oh, I want as much earnest money as possible. You have to know mm-hmm. that you are also going to be liable for that if you decide that you're going to you're going to default, which then, again, there could still be lawsuits and everything that come from a seller default too. But one thing seller needs to know about earnest money. Okay. All right. Let's go to another slide. We're flying through these. All right. FHA slash VA. Right. Those... Uh, so FHA, yep. I feel like this is one of those that a lot of people look at and they, they get it incorrect, right? Because right. I, I look at that and I'm like, first, I, I, I always think it's like the first time home buyer agreement or something like that. <laughs> right. um, and then VA, I just think like Veterans Association or, or right. whatever. So tell us yeah, what so those two actually FHA mean. and VA are not lenders. They set the guidelines that lenders follow that if those loans go bad, they have an insurance. So basically, they're mortgage insurance companies. VA loans are guaranteed where FHA are just insured. So they're slightly different, but they have very similar guidelines on what it takes to get those loans. So these are government-backed loans, not government-funded loans. Okay. So that's something a lot of people don't realize is FHA doesn't loan any money. Yeah. But what they do is they charge these fees that go into this big kitty that if they start having defaults based on their guidelines, they can have money to pay for those losses. So, um, but they're more relaxed. They have more flexible guidelines because of the type of clients they're going after. So, FHA is very common for first time home buyers. They're more lenient on credit score, job history, things that first time home buyers more often need than somebody that's a repeat buyer. Right. But you don't have to be a first time home buyer to get an FHA loan. One of the big things with VA is you do have to be a veteran. It's one of the best loans on the planet. Very similar guidelines to FHA, just funded a little bit differently. But again, they don't loan the money. The VA, the government, they're not mm. writing a check for the mortgage. They're covering the loan that if we loan it and follow their guidelines and the loan goes bad, the insurance covers uh, covers the loan. So you really have government-backed loans and then what's called conventional loans. That's just how the funding and how the insurance works to protect the investors. So a, a lot of people, they think when they see FHA that you have to be a first-time home buyer right. to get that. Is that true? Nope. No, there's just different guidelines if you are. There's a little more flexible guidelines if you are, and there's some other restrictions if you're not. But it's it's very similar. There's not a huge difference between the two. Okay. Also, if you haven't owned a home in the last 36 months, you're a first-time home buyer. And I always thought that was kind of a funny term, but that's what we call it. But if you sold and moved to a new area and you haven't bought a home in the last three years, you're now a first-time home buyer. Hmm. When you hear first time, you think ever. Oh, yeah. I, had a home, yeah. I owned a home 10 years ago. So I if it's more than three years, you can be a first-time home buyer again, which just opens up some of the leniency of some of those programs. Now, can I have multiple of these loans going no. on at the same time? No. There is some rules with VA. If there's a divorce situation and the wife's awarded the home, you can get another one. So there is some ways you can do multiple VAs, but they're a little bit more restrictive. And they're only owner-occupied. So it can't be something – you can do multiple FHAs, but it can't be, okay, I'm going to live in this one that I originally bought with an FHA, and then I'm going to go buy another FHA as an investment. Right. So it has to be primary residence. They don't do any investor uh, financing on either one of these programs. Interesting. All, All right, right, what do we got next? What else we got? Uh, Ooh. Earl. <laughs> Erla. Ooh. The Erla. Erla. Yeah, the that's Erla. That's not Erla. That's what, they, that's, that, that's what they do. That's Earl. Oh, well, yeah. I get, you know, actually, I did screw it up. It's U R L A. Okay. Oh, my slide's wrong. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't screw it up. All right. Well, all right. So, uh, URLA, U R A, or U R L A, is the Uniform Residential Loan Application. So, this is one every lender is going to use, regardless if it's a FHA, VA, conventional, whatever type of loan it is. 
that's the standardized form that we use to gather the information. Now, there may be some loans that have variations or addendums kind of added to it. If the, if the investor has a, uh, like a private money loan, a construction loan, there may be some additionals to it. But they've really, after 08, they've tried to standardize loan disclosures, forms, just so it's kind of the same kind of form. Yeah. This used to be called the 1003. It was Form 10003 that forever in our industry, we just call it the 1003. Why O? But there's because there's zero yeah. one zero zero three was the form number, so it just became known as the ten o three. So what they did recently, a few years ago, they expanded what they gathered. There's a lot more information on the application, and the nice thing as well is you can collapse certain boxes. Like before on the old ten o three, if they didn't have something in a box like a bunch of real estate or a bunch of debt or a bunch of jobs or a bunch of rentals, you just had those blank forms. Now you can collapse those forms so the application can be three pages long or 18. Hmm. So it's now more flexible where it used to be always page one, two, and three. You know, everything just fit on those pages. Now I've seen something go clear to 18 if there's yeah. multiple debts or, or real estate or something like that. So Erla is becoming more the common name that we've kind of replaced the 1003 with. So now, it's the application. So could that be like a, a real estate? So a real estate purchase contract that we've already talked about. It sounds like it's almost the loan side of that sure. in a way for, for, for lenders. With that said, with the um, a lot of the, the real estate docs, sometimes certain realtors or certain brokerages have their own their own type of, of ERLA, mm-hmm. right? Do lenders, is it all a state form or does each one have a different a No, different it's very, ERLA? The, the ERLA is very standard until you need something on top of it. I don't know anybody that has a completely different 1003 or mm-hmm. ERLA that's on their own. Almost everybody's gone to this form, regardless of the loan type, even private money loans, because it's kind of a standardized document and it answers all the questions we could ever need yeah. on almost any loan. Yeah. So the more complete that is, the more complete picture we have on getting them an approval. And I know a lot of people don't either have the answer or they skip it. Uh, you know, or they don't fill it out all the way because it can be a little intimidating going back the last two years of where you've lived and worked and yeah. all that type of stuff. But the more we, the more accurate we can get that, the more likely the approval will actually stick. Because you can put you make ten grand a month, yeah. And we get your pay stub W two, and maybe you took a lot of time off this year, and you only make five grand. Well, yeah. suddenly the application needs to be updated. But that form ties into all our automated systems. It pulls into our verifications. That's kind of the hub of everything that we do. The better you can do your application, the more likely you'll get an approval. Understood. All What's right. next? What else we got? Freddie Mac, our producer. SPCD. Ooh. There's not really a word. Yeah, there's not really a word on that one there. Like I said, Erla is actually said and not, you know, it's funny how some abbreviations are said and then other ones are the actual just the the letters. This one we do just say, hey, send me over the SPCDs. And so uh, this one is the seller's property condition disclosures. And you'll have this for really any property that that, uh, is bought or sold. And so uh, this is actually one of your deadlines uh, within, within your contract. And so what that means is that this is actually a packet and the packet used to be like six or seven pages long. Now it's like 18 to 20 pages long. It's so long. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it's a packet that the seller is going to take and fill out. And it's pretty much saying everything that they know may be wrong with the house. Also talking about things that are updated with the house or things that um, maybe they want the buyer to know about the place. But yeah, so it's just the, the seller's way of disclosing everything to the buyers. And then both the seller and the buyers need to sign on that before closing. Yeah, so it's like all like yes and no answers until you say yes to something. Yeah. Then you have a little comment section. You'll, you'll write say, down okay, what's going on. The property flooded. I added a yep. garage. I you know added solar panels. I sprinkler systems. You know all yeah. that kind of stuff. Okay. So, and yeah, and, and you got to be careful to not leave anything out on that. You're way right? better to over disclose. Oh, yeah. You're far yeah. better because if you have something where you say, well, we fixed it. Serve Pro came out and certified and all that kind of stuff. You're far better just to say, yep, yeah. we had a bathroom flood or. Yeah. Toilet flood, or the biggest one I would say that people need to look for is any additions to the property because it wasn't permitted or done correctly. That square footage doesn't count because it's not taxed correctly. It's not part of the value. And you'll see people that'll close in a sunroom or a garage or something like that, and they just are handyman or they just do it. Yeah, you want to know for sure, and you want to make sure it's actually permitted. That's where you'll see a difference from the appraiser square footage to what the county actually has. If you see a big jump. You know, okay, the county was never notified that you did pull the permit or do anything for, say, fixing or closing in the garage, right? Or a sunroom or an addition or something like that. So you really, you're as a seller, you're far better off just to over disclose on that. Yeah. All right. Got anything <laughs> else here? Oh, hey, uh, here's one. Lay and CDs. So CDs, I used to listen to those as a kid. Um, huh. What about an LE? All right. So. After the 2008 crisis, one of the things they felt that loan officers were doing is the old GFE, which was a good faith estimate. Every client would ask for I still get clients every once in a while that ask for a GFE. I'm like, wow, that's been a long time since I've issued a GFE. Mm -hmm. So the government, same with changing out the application, they came up with these standard forms that every lender uses. So it's a side-by-side comparison between what you're going to get 
as quoted to what you're going to get at the end. So the loan estimate has certain functions in it that cannot go up. So you can't tell a client, oh, you're only going to be charged 200 bucks for an appraisal, go to closing, and it's 500 bucks. Right. So a lot of times what you're seeing is they felt that, that they were slamming in the booth. We actually had a term where you slam them in the booth. They're all the way through the process. They're ready to go. They're at the closing table, and all of a sudden, it's 10 grand more to close because their initial estimate was not even close. Yeah. It, was not, it had no weight to it. It had no accountability to it. So the government said, nope, we want you to issue a loan estimate that actually should get better by the time you get to closing than worse. But we know things can change. Maybe you do a homeowner's insurance quote or you get the title fee, something changes and it does go up. So they do allow a little bit of room. It's about 10% on only certain categories. Other categories can't change at all. Hmm. So if you quote 200 bucks for an appraisal yeah. and it's more, we have to eat it. So what you've seen lenders do is they pad those numbers a little bit. We want to make sure that loan estimate is a little on the worst case side. Yeah. So that way we don't get caught holding for a credit report or appraisal or a foundation search or whatever that we need. Also, it regulated that you cannot charge more than the invoice. So if your credit report's $48.28, that's what you have to charge. You can't just charge 100 bucks for an application or 200 bucks for an application fee. Okay. So that's what the loan estimate did. How about a CD? So CD is you take the loan estimate and all the numbers are finalized. So you got the insurance, taxes, everything. You have to issue a CD or closing disclosure hmm. that's very similar to the LE. They look almost the same. They have a little bit more information, but now this is locked in. The CD is what you're going to see at closing, and you have to get it three days before you close. So there is no way that you can just get slammed in the booth. There's no way that you can just show up and not know what your closings are. You have three full days to determine um, if you want the loan. If, and if it matches what you actually thought you were going to get. And there's way more penalties for us. So if we don't do that right, we have to buy back the loan. Mm -hmm. We have to credit them back. So there's a lot more weight to our disclosures. It can't just be something where you say, hey, yeah, this loan's only going to cost you two grand. And you go to closing, and it's 15000 or yeah. something like that. So yeah. that's what those two things, very common. LE is the initial estimate. CD is the final closing disclosure that you can compare side by side. There's even a form or within the form. It literally said, this is what you were quoted. Here's what you actually got. What's the difference? If it's too much of a difference, we can't issue the closing disclosure. We have to credit it back to the borrower. So way more accountability on, on our disclosures, which okay. I really like. What else we have? What other abbreviations? What Ooh. is MLS? This is a good one, and this is something that everybody should uh, should kind of be aware aware of because this is actually something that's probably going to be changing here over these next few years. There's already been a lot of talk of actually creating a, a national MLS. So uh, MLS is the multiple listing service, uh, and you'll see this for a lot of people look at this they say, oh, Zillow, the MLS, right? right, right. Like a thing, Zillow, Realtor.com is the MLS. So the MLS is it can also be specific per county, mm. per state. Um, some states just have one MLS for the entire state. Utah, it, it seems like there's been some effort to try to get it going in that direction of making one MLS for the entire state. With that said, all of the properties are still going to be posted on Zillow, Realtor.com for the most part. Uh, however, the MLS is essentially... Uh, really an association that each individual realtor or brokerage is associated with. Right. So, so anytime, multiple listing service. I, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So so right. anytime that I have a listing, right, right. I'm, I'm a member of the Washington County MLS, Iron County MLS, and then the Utah uh, Real Estate MLS, which really covers the entire state of Utah. Right. With that said, if there's an agent who's only a member of, say, the Washington County MLS, when you post that listing, uh, your client's house is only going to be shown on really MLSs that are shown within Washington County and, and just those websites. That's why it's important to hire agents who are members of multiple different MLSs so you can get a lot more visibility. Yeah, you just get more eyeballs on it because it's posted to more places. Yeah. Like yeah. you would post to Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. All, the more you're posting it, the more chance you're going to have different eyeballs, different demographics looking at it. And uh, the system here, I think, is called Flex. It's kind of the right. name of the system that you guys use. I don't think the Salt like, Lake One's Flex. Is it is a no, different company and, that kind and, of prepared it, And right? it's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it is a difficult website to use, but really? <laughs> uh, Flex is great, uh, it, but I'm probably just more used to it. And right. I mean, Las Vegas, I just joined Las Vegas, and they're, they're on Matrix, it's a totally different software. Right. But And yeah. that, I mean, Zillow can be a form of an MLS, but it's not the actual listing within yep. the county and state. And a lot of times the Zillow and Realtor.com might pull data that could be inaccurate or not quite as accurate as ones that are checked by the actual professionals. Right. So you'll see, I, I saw a listing that popped up, some random listing on, on Zillow that was like $126,000 house or something. And it blew up everywhere trying to, oh, hey, look at this house. You know, because everybody was like, holy cow, 126. Yeah. And found out it was like a 15 year old listing that just somehow populated onto Zillow. So you really, that's where the agents can help you make sure these are true active listings and whether they're pending or what's going on with them. Yeah. And, and, and that's important because there's, there's a, a very big confusion right now because everybody looks at Zillow as just this 
big MLS, which in a way, yes, it's it's taking all the properties, but we can't go in and, and edit that right, on right. Zillow very much at all. Once it populates from that other MLS, you can't change yep. it. Yeah, so you it, see a lot of misinformation on Zillow. And there has been a lot of discussion over the past year, especially even about a national MLS, where it's just one place for every home in the country to be to be posted, which in a way could could be good. I'd love to. I'd love to kind of see a a, a world where at least we have that option. Great. Those are some of those common abbreviations you run across in the mortgage and real estate world. So I hope you found that interesting and like and share the video and let us know other abbreviations you want to know about in the comments and we'll get that on a future video. Great. See you next time. This has been a Clear to Close podcast with Ryan Bolton and Carson Jones. Please submit your comments, questions, and topics for future episodes to clear to close pod at gmail.com. That's clear the number two, close pod at gmail.com. Or find my home utah.com or ryanbolton.com. Please like, follow, and share. And until next time, this is the Clear to Close podcast. Views expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Patriot Home Mortgage or Team Honey with Red Rock Real Estate. License number NMLS 299717. This has been a production from A Podcast Studio.